Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes, and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up. If you don't subscribe to our women's performance newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. Hi, Feisties. It is Friday, April 7th, and I'm recording this intro right after I just recorded with Alex Coates, who's a PhD in exercise physiology. Um, and I'm just so because I don't I didn't think anyone could make me so excited about science. Like, don't get me wrong, like I love science, but I'm also someone who kind of just wants the outcomes science. You know what I mean? Like I kind of want someone else to understand all the inner workings of the body and, and to tell me what to do. So, um, no, but Alex was amazing. Her enthusiasm for what she does, what she's learning for understanding overtraining and, and overreaching and underfueling is incredible. Um, so I wanted to jump on right away and record this intro. So Alexandra Coates is a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University, and she is studying systems level integrative exercise physiology. Her research has focused on overtraining, underfueling, and the effects of extreme exercise on the body. I know Alex because her and her twin sister, Kyla, were elite triathletes here who trained with the National Training Center. Uh, that was from 2007 to 2015 for Alex. She raced internationally on multiple world championship teams and was an age group triathlon coach for 10 years. Alex and I talk about her experiences and the experiences also interestingly of her twin sister, Kyla, who was the training partner of a medal hopeful for the 2012 Olympics and suffered from Kyla suffered from severe symptoms of overtraining and underfueling. And as I mentioned, I didn't think I could get so excited about overtraining syndrome and low energy availability, <laughs> but it turns out I can. And I think that these concepts are something that all active people should understand in order to stay healthy and active through our lives. So the conversation actually honestly really helped me personally understand some of the pitfalls I fell into in my own athletic career and why I fail to make gains sometimes. Also why I feel healthy now um, and how to keep myself healthy while trying to stay active and exercise for a lifetime. So I think this podcast will help you all in the same way. At least I'm hoping that it does. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that I am in Tucson right now. So if you, I'm using my travel mic, if you notice a slight difference in the sound, that is why. Um, and, but I wanted to say that because I have been using Prevenix's Immune Health Plus product, which the CEO promised me that he never gets ill when he uses this, pro this product. So I've been testing it out because I also travel a lot and I also started recently traveling even more than I normally do. And so far, so good. So now I don't leave home without it. So very grateful to have Prevenix as one of our sponsors here on the Women's Performance Podcast. I have also set up my second blood draw with Inside Tracker. So last time I was, I did my last one a couple of years ago. I was 45 and my inner age came out as 41. And anyone who knows me knows I got a little bit disappointed with that because I was expecting my inner age to be way lower for some weird reason. Um, so I'm going to find out whether I can, whether I can do better. Hopefully I can. In any case, buckle up. You're in for a great episode. I hope you like it as much as I did. Oh, and I totally almost forgot to say our course, uh, the first feisty 
first ever feisty course. It's called Fueled. If you've been listening for a while, you've probably heard all about it by now. It is a comprehensive nutrition course for active women. And Alex has actually been involved in the creation of that course. I am, we, we basically had three main experts on the course. One um, is Dr. Erin Ayala, who has been in a different episode of this podcast, and she was um, she's our sports psychologist. And then uh, Alex Coates, who I talked to today, is our physiologist. And then we have Elizabeth Impine, who is our sports nutritionist. Uh, but yeah, so Alex and I talk a little bit about the process of creating the course and some of the, the things that she brought to the table for the course and why the course was so important for her also to work on. Um, it is going to be on sale from April 12th to 21st for the founding cohort. So if you are interested in that, head to fueledcourse.com. And if it's before April 12th, then join the waitlist and we'll send you all the info. If it's between April 12th and 21st, you can go ahead and sign up if you, if that's something that, if you want to, to create a nutrition plan for your active life. And then after the 21st, don't worry if you're listening to this later and you're, you do have an interest in the course, you can go still find out all about it at fueledcourse.com. But also we will be running um, a few different cohorts of that course. We wanted to run the course in cohorts um, just so that people had if you want, if you're someone who wants a community to work through some of the materials with, that you can have that. So you don't have to use all the, the cohort or those community aspects or the live um, interactive se sessions with the experts. But if you want to, they will be there for you. And I think that's really important to us at Feisty because we're all about like community and support and all of those good things. So um, that is why we're running it in cohorts and it's not just there all the time to be purchased. Anyway, I've talked long enough. Enjoy the show. Hey, Alex, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? I am great. It is so good to see you. We've been working a little bit like tangentially on the same project with the fueled course, but I haven't seen you, I think, through since our initial conversations. So, but I'm excited about it. Me too. Me too. Yeah. We've just been communicating through comments on documents. So yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So for those who don't know, uh, we, we at Feisty, we've been working pretty hard on a course called Fueled, which is a comprehensive nutrition course for women, specifically for active women. Um, and Alex is our exercise physiologist. Um, and I want to, I wanted to have her on the podcast today just to like get a bit more background about you and why you chose physiology. Why did you choose exercise physiology? I think so. Yeah, I did my undergraduate degree in kinesiology and that was just kind of a great fit because I was training um with the national team in Victoria uh, for triathlon and I just you know sports was kind of the thing but I also really like science so uh kinesiology was the easy choice and I honestly it was like Victoria or nothing because I went there for a triathlon I understand that so did I <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, yeah um and so yeah my undergraduate undergrad was very long it was like a seven-year undergrad because I was training um but I did just get more and more interested in exercise physiology through that time and I think by the end of my degree I just was there were so many questions that I was having like I, even in terms of so reds wasn't a thing yet um but actually funny enough me and my twin sister Kyla we for our like undergraduate um it was like end of I don't know course like presentation that we did it was like a student student seminar and we did it on what we called an update to the athlete triad oh really this is an undergrad undergrad yeah and this is before wow. reds came out so we had this update to the athlete triad we wanted to include men we wanted to include all of these symptoms that we believed existed um that were not you know part of an athlete triad Mm -hmm. And so basically we invented reds before reds came out and it's documented. <laughs> so yeah. wait, is it possible? So your, your twin sister, Kyla, she mm -hmm. used to work um, for like for the triathlon club that I owned like years and years ago. I, this is sounding so vaguely familiar to me, like potentially you were working on that project back then. Probably. Yeah. It yeah. was like 2000 and 
2013, 2014, something like that. Um, right. And so, yeah, that's what we were into. I mean, Kyla had a lot of trouble with reds, but also um, overtraining syndrome and everything. And so that's really what got us into it because we were like, the physiology, the exercise physiology can't explain what we're seeing. It's not answering these questions. Um, and yeah, that's why I, that's the long story of why I got into it. It's not that long a story because I want more details. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, for our audience, just real quickly in case, you know, we've talked about this a few times in the podcast, but what is like the female athlete triad? What is REDS and what is LEA? Just briefly. Yeah, yeah, sure. Fun. So the female athlete triad first started in, was being studied by Dr. Drinkwater, Barbara Drinkwater in the 1980s. So she was mm-hmm. noticing that gymnasts were presenting with, um, stress fractures and osteoporosis in their spines. And she realized that those athletes that had this low bone mineral density in their spines um, also weren't having a period. And so she Mm -hmm. kind of put two and two together and realized that it was driven by an energy deficiency. They weren't taking in as much calories as their healthy teammates. Then they were losing their period and they were having this low bone mineral density um, Mm -hmm. that could lead to osteoporosis. So that was the female athlete triad. And this was, wow, yeah. it's so interesting to think like that's so recent that someone was like, oh, I noticed because we hear that all the time now, right? Like we understand the connection between hormones and bone density and all of those things. But like not that long ago, there was a woman who made an observation and that's how we ended up with the science. Exactly. And so that was 19, yeah, basically the 1990s when she first noticed this. And then, you know, there was kind of progressions to that model. It became more of a spectrum. So they wanted to recognize that you could be, you know, not necessarily have disordered eating or eating disorders. You could just be taking in insufficient calories and that could lead to low bone mineral density. That wasn't even quite, you know, osteoporosis or anything, just that would degrade bone health um, Mm -hmm. and then could cause menstrual disturbances and not necessarily a full blown loss of period. Mm -hmm. So that was the model. Um, It still exists today. And there's definitely people who like, that female athlete model uh, more than the relative energy deficiency in sport models. So there's kind of a bit of a debate among scientists there. But where the relative energy deficiency in sport model kind of came in was that uh, Margot Mountjoy, who is out in Hamilton and Guelph, and she's a family physician and a PhD. She came out with the REDS model because she noticed, similar to what me and my sister were noticing, that there's just so many more systems that are impacted by this energy deficit so it's not just bone it's not just menstrual cycle you know you've got a whole bunch of hormonal impacts of not having enough calories your basal metabolic rate is going to be suppressed you're going to have all of these different blood markers that'll show up um you know there's cardiovascular implications there's changes to the immune system there's basically all your systems are affected when your body is in a state of stress and starvation and it's not just in women right? It's like men are impacted by this as well. Just because we can't see it with changes in menstrual cycle doesn't mean they don't also get it. So that's what's kind of nice about the REDS model. It's just more comprehensive. Um, And it seems to make more sense when you when you're experiencing it yourself. You're like, yeah, it's more than just bone and menstrual cycle. Um, Yeah. And then low energy availability is essentially insufficient calories taken in um, to meet it's, it's basically the recovery demands of exercise. So, so the, the calculation is um, energy intake minus exercising energy expenditure. And you're not looking for a zero. You're not looking for en- energy in versus energy out. There's actually different thresholds where we start to see symptoms. We're actually looking at like about a 40 to 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day mm-hmm. that you need to take in to be healthy. And so that works out to be much more calories than, than like a net zero. Um, so for like, say a female athlete who is 60 kilograms body weight. So that's 48 kilo, that's 48 kilograms of fat-free mass. Um, she would need to take in close to 2000 calories a day without exercising to stay in this healthy range. Um, whereas we, we often think like, Oh, if you're not exercising, you know, you could do calories in calories out, maybe only take in like 1500 calories a day but no like to stay healthy you do need to be taking in more and that's to go towards the adaptation and recovery of your systems from exercise 
Mm. Okay. Wow. That's a great explanation, by the way, <laughs> a few explanations of that was okay. So then you just to go back to that moment, like, or that time period at the end of your undergrad, you and your sister have, did you, did both of you have some sort of symptoms of LEA as when you invented LEA? Yeah, when I invented it, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you have some symptoms that you felt like weren't accounted for in the literature? Yeah, it was mostly my my sister. So Kyla was Paula Finley's main training partner um, leading into the 2012 Olympics. And so we know that Paula didn't have a great Olympics. Um, she was, you know, most certainly in reds. At least she was anemic. We know she was anemic, so we can't, I don't want to make assumptions. But my sister, anyways, I can make assumptions about my sister. Um, she was going on all of these altitude training camps with Paula. She was just kind of meant to be you know, the training partner, essentially. And um, she started, like, having more and more of these symptoms every time she would go to altitude to the point where by the, her last um, altitude camp, they pulled me in as the backup because Kyla couldn't get out of bed, like, at all. Oh. And exercise, she couldn't get out of bed. Um, that, then, of course, she, you know, would kind of recover and would come back to sport, but she was passing out in almost all of her races, she had no ability to thermoregulate in races. Um, she basically her body was completely shutting down. She started. She had stress fractures. She, it was it was this mixture of reds and the, what we would call now overtraining syndrome. So it was definitely both. But basically, she just had this whole host of very bad symptoms that eventually ended with her having to stop um, training for triathlon. And I was mostly fine, to be honest. Like I was, uh, for me, the hardest part was trying to support her through that because she was very successful triathlete. That's why she was Paula's, you know, training partner. She was better than me, you know, in triathlon. And then to for her not to be able to get back to it in a healthy way, like she certainly couldn't handle training at all. She couldn't even handle. She was to the point where she couldn't handle like a walk around the block, kind of. Thing. Wow. Um, so yeah, that was our questions. Our questions were all like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. And what was the response and the support at that time? Like how did the national, not to like throw anyone under the bus, because I know like we, we know like a lot of people involved in that system, but like, what were the things that, that what support did she have and what could have been better? I think, yeah, it's hard because at that time we didn't have reds as a model. You know, we had the female athlete tribe, but we didn't have reds and reds really did help us have a better understanding of just the impacts of low energy availability on all the systems. So I feel like that nowadays would be the first things, you know, a physiologist mm. would address. They'd be like, okay, let's look at, at energy intake, but nobody looked at that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, didn't look at that at all. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> from the like passing out in races perspective, it was really bad like one point she was hospitalized had full rhabdomyolysis and almost died um <laughs> her body couldn't thermoregulate and so and wow. her blood pressure would go to zero and they kind of tried to figure that out a little like they brought her into the lab once and they did a, a graded exercise test and they watched her blood pressure go to zero and they thought it was a mistake with the blood pressure machine and then she almost passed out and then they were like oh that's real um and they tried doing salt loading because we thought maybe it was a salt imbalance and it's not it's like a it's a full system it's an autonomic you know blood pressure regulation issue um so they were trying but I think the problem is that they just didn't have the information and I don't I think we still don't have the information when it comes to you know some of this chronic fatigue overtraining syndrome type stuff but uh they tried a bit I think if Kyla had been one of you know, the more uh, funded athletes, like the top end type, then they probably would have paid attention more, but she was kind of disposable. And um, so that's where some of our anger came from. It was like, no one was taking it seriously enough. Uh, yeah. But at, at the same time, on the flip side, nobody knew anything. So it wasn't from, you know, they just didn't know. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to me. Like, did, how did they explain, you know, I think, I, I mean, I've been in situations like that where it's like, you're looking at maybe like, is it sodium? Is it magnesium? Like how did at the time, what was the nutrition advice that she would have been getting, or you would have been getting as like 
as members of the national development team? Like what kind of information did you have about how much to eat and what to eat? We, <laughs> um, well, we were in the time where we, there wasn't a very good understanding of female athlete development. Um, a number of athletes on our squad got kicked out of the team because they weren't meeting the national standards, but they were also being told that they were, they needed to lose weight and that they were too heavy. Um, <laughs> so there was a lot of emphasis on leanness. Um, and like, once again, like looking back, it's terrible now, but like, it's weird. They just didn't know. Like you can, you almost, you almost like they didn't get it and it's not necessarily their fault, but looking back, it's just awful. It's like all of these girls were going through normal physiological changes that we would expect to happen. And of course we were told to lose weight. There was no guidance. Um, and then, yeah, from the thermal regulation and stuff, it was just Kyla was taking like a hundred salt tablets before a race and like, just like, <laughs> It, it didn't oh, make man. sense. It, that wasn't the yeah. problem. It, the salt wasn't the problem. So um, that that was the only thing that they tried, and it didn't work. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that's. To the, I think it's to the point too that like a lot of the coaches and the support network then and even now, it's not necessarily that anyone's intending harm. It's like, no, exactly. it's like they don't know, and you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't abuse. It was just literally like they thought, yeah, to be fast, you should have, as a woman, you should have under 20% body fat. And like, that's not true, <laughs> but that's what they they actually thought. And so then they were like, cool, oh, like you, you know, girls need to lose some fat and let's try and find safe ways to do so. But there is no safe way to do so at that age, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So it's funny because I can't, you know, I was a triathlete in the same time frame, you know, a tri triathlete, sorry. And like, you know, I can't think of a single woman who wasn't at some point and the, the guys too, to be fair, but like super controlling intake, like as part of our like regimented tr or training regimen. Kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, exactly. And like looking back, I eat more now than I did when I was training <laughs> and, and it's so bad. It's like, I was training so much you know I, I should have eaten so much and like I mean maybe I don't eat more but I eat like more than I probably should <laughs> now considering I don't exercise but yeah the time you you just way too analytical even without any sort of hints of eating disorder or, or anything you just were expected you know like yeah big salads and like you know, clean eating and everything when yeah. you should have been taking in like as much carbohydrate as you possibly could and not even worrying about calories at all. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's funny to think now and like where, and, and a lot of people that I know and myself included, like I, I didn't necessarily even have some of the thinking of disordered eating. I was just kind of like doing what I was told or what I had read or what I thought I needed to do. So like ending up in the state of LEA and various, like in and out of LEA, I'm sure throughout my career, if I look back, I could probably document that, but like, yeah, but like, essentially like I wasn't like, Oh, concerned about what I looked like per se, or I didn't have like a mental health issue, but I was kind of just doing what I was told. So you can like fall into that state. Yeah. I also did a stint of paleo diet, which retrospectively was the worst thing ever. But like at the time I was like, this is cool. It's supposed to make, you know, fat burning. And then you can save the carbohydrates for race day, and about, which we now know is actually not, doesn't work that way. But at the time, and I was like into the science, I was like, yeah, I'm going to conserve, conserve my carbohydrate for race day. And Mm -hmm. yeah, that caused red reds for sure so <laughs> yeah I think we all had that stage of like trying to cut back carbs somehow or like I somehow thought I was gonna get like an overcompensation effect yes, you know exactly. that was yeah. that was mm -hmm. gonna be yeah I remember going out and now I'm on a side tangent but <laughs> like going out being in like the Swiss Alps for a training camp at altitude going on long runs where like our our what the whole purpose was to go above 2,000 meters so that we were like higher up Mm -hmm. run up past the tree line, run for two hours up there and run back, which would end up being like a three hour run. Doesn't matter where you go. If you get eat by, eaten by a mountain lion, yeah. apparently. but like, <laughs> but I used to take like, literally I would take like five jelly beans. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. And put the, not eat, like I wouldn't eat anything and have black coffee, go out with the, with the five jelly beans. And when I started to feel like, you know, bonkish, like I was, didn't have enough blood sugar. I would just like stick a jelly bean, like 
in the back of my teeth so I could taste it for a long time because you know how you get a response to tasting the sugar. So I would use that and I would sometimes have a good run like that, right? But like the knock on effect of that, right? Because then you're like so far behind in your caloric, like how was I training then? Like if that was a Sunday, like what what was happening Tuesday or Wednesday that week? We probably should have been looking at couldn't adapt to that training too. It like blunts that adaptation to the stress. So like you're doing all this crazy training and you're working so hard and then you're not even getting the benefits of it because yeah, yeah, I did stuff like that too. It's yeah. Sad. And we didn't know, we didn't know, like I was well, told to do that, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's yeah, like, okay. Exactly. It's so yeah. sad. Building muscle can be tough and gains can be so slow, even for those of us who do a lot of strength training. As an ex-endurance athlete who is now in perimenopause, I know this all too well. It can be frustrating to put in the time in the gym and not see the results I'm looking for. That's why it's super important to take the right supplements at the right time. One of those supplements is essential amino acids, which are needed to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis happens when you eat high quality protein like eggs or whey. And by supplementing with additional essential amino acids, you can make sure you are getting the full benefit of your training sessions. Targeted essential amino acid formulas can be up to four times more effective than just eating protein. I've been taking amino acids for almost a year, and in combination with eating quality protein and a couple other supplements, I have managed to turn the tides on age-related muscle loss, which starts at 30 for women, by the way, and I have continued to make strength gains as I head towards 50. AminoCo has been a longtime sponsor of Feisty Media and has supported all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. As we head into summer, rest and recovery are critical for improving sports performance, reducing stress, and living a long and healthy life. We should all invest in better sleep. So think about the thing you lay your head on for eight hours a night. If it's not exactly right for you, it can lead to needless tossing and turning, or worse, have you waking up with an unrelenting kink in your neck. My new Lagoon pillow has helped me improve my sleep immensely by pairing me with the performance pillow that has everything I need. So I personally was matched with the Otter pillow, shout out to Team Otter, which I love because it has a gentle cooling effect. And I was able to choose how much stuffing I wanted in it, which is super important to me because I'm doing a decent amount of CrossFit these days and my shoulders are kind of creaky. So having a pillow that is stuffed just to the right height keeps my neck and head in exactly the right position and comfortable for the entire night. And as of fall 2023, Lagoon launched their 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. It's cool to the touch, buttery soft, and great for your skin and hair. You've got to go check out this pillowcase if you want to feel great and look great every morning. Waking up for morning workouts has never felt better. I'm refreshed and pain-free thanks to my Lagoon pillow. To check it out for yourself, go to lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance and take the two-minute sleep quiz to find your perfect pillow match and then use the code PERFORMANCE for 15% off your first purchase. That's code PERFORMANCE at lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance, whole 15% off, and the link is in the show notes. You can just click through there. As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tofosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. 
Tofosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They're shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat, so they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tofosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20. FM as in Feisty Media to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Um, so back to the timeline, you know, you, you chose to then do your PhD. You studied um, overtraining syndrome. Am I right about that? Yeah, it was, so my research was all on overreaching. So that would be like the early when you, it's basically like, I call it training camp stress. So it's like when you train to the point of underperformance from very hard training, but you will bounce back. Like, you know, you take a week of recovery, functional overreaching is you take about a week of recovery and you'll bounce back doesn't necessarily mean you're going to super compensate but you will get back to where you were um and then non-functional overreaching takes longer to recover from so it takes over two weeks sometimes it takes a couple months um in that case you don't bounce back like you're not going to um get to the same level as you were before but that's because it just takes so long to recover from it Mm. and then the far end of the spectrum would be overtraining syndrome But I think that overtraining syndrome, and I think a lot of researchers agree now, overtraining syndrome isn't necessarily like just this progression of overreaching to overtraining syndrome. We think that there's underlying uh, issues that are not really training related and it could be like post-viral. It could, like it it presents very much like your chronic fatigue or your long COVID or your Lyme disease. It's like, it's just kind of a systems breakdown. And because there's not very good evidence that it comes from just training too much, we think it's probably just kind of one of these other issues going on. And it just so happens to be happening in athletes, if you know what I mean. Uh, So my research was all on overreaching. So it's like, you can induce it. We do three weeks of very hard training, get people to the point where they're underperforming. And then I look at the uh, physiological effects of that. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. So for our audience, like what would, if someone thought that maybe they were, are overreaching or if they have in the past, like what are some of the symptoms of that? What what would that look like? Okay. So it's really fun. I think it's really fun. Um, Overreaching is distinguishable from say an energy deficiency by the fact that it's, it, you pretty much only see the symptoms of it when you're exercising. So whereas with energy deficiency, you can do blood tests, you can look at, you know, different you can look at like resting heart rate and blood pressure. Those will be lower with an energy deficiency. With mm-hmm. overreaching, we might not see any changes to resting heart rate. We might not see changes to resting heart rate variability. But when you start to exercise and when you're exercising at like a moderate to hard intensity, your heart rate is suppressed and it can be suppressed by about 10 beats per minute. So you have to work harder to get your heart rate to go up. And then you also, uh, your max heart rate will be decreased by about 10 beats per minute at most like five to ten so you just kind of can't hit your max oh hmm. yeah and we also find that wow that's like the story of my life okay (laughs) that that people say i can't get my heart rate up yeah or it feels like i can't sprint um lactate is suppressed same as heart rate so at any intensity your lactate is lower you can't hit the same peak lactates um i did a study just recently that we're about to submit and we also saw suppressed exercising glucose uh, with the glucose monitors. So kind of interesting. Um, We're not a hundred percent sure what is driving this response, but it really just feels like your body can't react to the exercise in the same way. And it's a very acute effect. So like, you know, those would be all things you'd expect to happen after 
you get fitter, like a long period of training, you have, you know, a reduced heart rate at a given load, reduced lactate at a given load. That happens when you get fitter, but this isn't that. It's like one week you're fine. And then the next week, you know, heart rate suppressed, lactate suppressed, you can't push, you feel bad yeah. in training, your performance is reduced. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's that real, like literally is like the story of my life. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Do you, and, okay. So then if, you know, if you're an athlete who finds that you're in that situation quite a lot, like maybe you're just regularly, like if I was going to explain that, the reason that I ended up there so often right off the top of my head, I'd say like, probably we were putting the training blocks together in a, we could have put them together in a better way that allowed me to recover better or something like that. Like, how do you then kind of reframe the way that you're thinking about your training? If you think that you are experiencing this? Yeah. I think that you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's getting, a bit more recovery and it just probably means you're putting together too big of a training block and it could even be you know you needed a couple extra recovery days in between your hard days or you know like if you were doing three week blocks switch it to two or two and a half week blocks before you get you know four days down or something like that it's like it's always just so I find in my research when I'm trying to get people to this state there's definitely gonna be some people who don't get there. They're just like, fine. (laughs) Um, And then there's some people who are more reactive, but it does seem to take more than two weeks of hard training. So like they're doing, sometimes people will get there at the end of the two weeks, but most people need three full weeks of this hard training and then they're there. Um, And yeah, and and so yeah, a lot of it comes down to if we had just backed off at two weeks, or if I did my data collection at two weeks, I wouldn't see it because they were almost there but weren't quite there. Um, and so just if you had recovery at that point, then then you would have been good. And the other thing too is functional overreaching is yeah, it could take as little as like five, four or five days, and you're good, and maybe even having a super compensation. So you don't need like a ton of recovery. You just need you know a few days to absorb the training, and then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But sometimes a few days feels like a lot when we're used to like, I can remember trying to offload a three day block in like half a day sometimes. Yeah. You know exactly. what I mean? <laughs> That's our problem. That's the problem yeah. with triathlon. It's just, it's just, you go too hard all the time. There's too much intensity, like other sports, we think about running, you know, they might do two to three hard workouts a week, like triathlon, you're doing two hard workouts a day, almost every day. Like, it's like, we train weights so much that and this is where I feel like some scientists will be like oh overreaching isn't a thing it's like yeah it is you just haven't trained for triathlon yet like try (laughs) (laughs) it is (laughs) yeah Yeah, well and like trying to improve at three sports is a is a difficult thing to to get right to right in the first place um but yeah so interesting so you don't see it as much with runners or single sport athletes It's like, I mean, I can get them there because like in my research, uh, just, you know, I add in, I do biking uh, as the additional training. So there's like less chance of injury and then, yeah, it's easy to get them there. But in like, yeah, your normal runner, even high level runners, you don't see it as much um, because it is very intensity. I mean, I wouldn't say it's entirely intensity dependent, but it's easier to get someone to a point of overreached, overreaching when they're, when you throw in a lot of intensity. Uh, just kind of accelerates the process. So, and like, that's the thing with triathlon, we do a lot of intensity in the pool. Um, so even if you're training for longer distance, but you know, you're doing, you're doing that high intensity work in the pool, um, that can just be kind of what pushes you over the edge. Right. And, you know, I'm thinking of CrossFit here too, which is what I do Mm -hmm. now, which is like super intense, you know, day in, day out. Like I've had to modify that to like have some lifting days and some days when I'm actually going really hard. And then some days when I'm just doing an easy jog or a swim. Um, But what do you, like, does it, how, do you know anything about how like overreaching again, I'm thinking of like our, our active audience here, like overreaching in relation to like regular life stresses. Like, are you more likely to push into that zone? If you have a stressful life, yeah. three kids and a bunch of responsibilities. I think so. So there's no, yeah, no good research on that, that I'm aware of, but like, yeah, anecdotally, like, yeah, it, <laughs> man. I feel so bad in my own training. So I'm always enrolled in these studies where I have to do max VO2 max tests. Like I do like two VO2 max tests a week. Right now I I did one yesterday and I felt so bad in it. And it's just, I have so much going on and I'm so 
tired all the time. And it's not from training. It's just from like, I don't get a minute to rest. And then, yeah, my VO2 max tests suck. And I think that that's, that's exactly it. It's like your body can only handle so much stress. Stress does, you know, I wouldn't say there's a, the kind of general stress that we, we like to think of as like every type of stress causes the same the same physiology. Oh yeah. Stress is stress. That's a, I've heard that a million times. Is that not true? Yeah, it probably is true. Like to an extent. I repeat that to people. So please, please correct me. Update my files. I think it probably is true to an extent. It's just that there are different stressors. So like, you know, energy stress to me is going to cause a different pathway, stress pathway in the body than training stress. And then if we've got like mental stress, at the end of the day, it's stress and it all adds up and it's additive, but I do think there can be like different outcomes of it. Um, mm. Sometimes. That totally <laughs> makes, that that totally that makes that sense. Ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all that is to say when you're tired, when you have kids and you're working and you're doing the things, yeah, chances are you, you're going to get overreached a lot easier than someone who has the time to recover in between sessions and fuels properly and naps and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Okay. And to, to bring it back to fueling too, like what's the connection between overreaching and under fueling? Is there, will you get into a state of like overreach faster if you don't fuel properly or what's the, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, we don't know yet. Um, so, oh, interesting. Yeah. So there was kind of a debate among physiologists on Twitter <laughs> about mm -hmm. whether or not you on Twitter, <laughs> of course. <Yeah. laughs> Whether or not you would see an underperformance from overreaching or overtraining with if energy balance was maintained. And mm. that study has not been done. So that study is so funny. Thinking back, that study was basically my first ever grant proposal was I'm going to do this study, mm. maintain energy balance and see if I can get people to be underperforming just from training stress. Mm -hmm. um and i that's so interesting yeah we still haven't done it we haven't done <laughs> so it it's very hard so the reason why no one has done it yet is it's so hard to know exactly what calories in and calories out are during training right um and to make sure that the athletes are taking in enough and to like know for sure that they're in energy balance and so louise burke does a lot of these studies out in australia she's like the one researcher that does this so she uses the international um like olympic race walkers from all around the world and she does these big studies where she feeds them everything that they eat and they get put into different groups and then they do races at the end with prize money so that's like a proper you know performance indicator Mm -hmm. And I don't know where all that money comes from, but we certainly haven't been able to do that here in Canada. Mm -hmm. But okay, so I think that that study obviously is what we need to do to know for sure if they if that's possible. I have a very strong opinion that they are separate stressors and that training stress, even if you're in energy balance, can still, you know, if you train hard enough, you can get to this point of overreaching, have these physiological symptoms underperform and that low energy availability is going to cause a separate host of symptoms that will eventually lead to under underperformance, but that it doesn't necessarily cause underperformance right away. Mm -hmm. um, so that because, <laughs> because they have different symptoms mm -hmm. and one causes underperformance and one doesn't right away, um, I think that, yeah, we can consider them separate stressors, but they so often happen at the same time because right. unintentionally, let's say you just are doing a training camp or you're, yeah, yeah, you're doing a training camp. So your training load goes up and you don't increase your caloric intake to match that training because you're not used to it or because, you know, high intensity training makes you lose your appetite a lot of the time or because you're literally on the bike for so long that you don't have time to take in enough fuel. So all of those reasons, you're simultaneously overreaching or overtraining and in a state of low energy availability. And so that's where, um, <laughs> yeah, we don't know. We don't know if it like make, makes things worse, probably does. Uh, what the outcomes of that are, we don't really know at this point.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a, and a quick question for those who like maybe don't do endurance sport or CrossFit or like does overreaching or under fueling <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> any of these things affect like a, do you call it like a more skills-based sport or team sport, like where you might like soccer or basketball, something like mm -hmm. that, where you might be like, you know, you're still doing physical training, but you also have to have your faculties in order to like yeah. do the skills and learn things. And you're working with a team, like how do those, how does LEA and overreaching show up in those kinds of sports? Um, so one of the like earliest performance studies on low energy availability showed that. And so this is, yeah, <laughs> studies looking at performance with low energy availability are kind of rare at this point. I think it's mm -hmm. just it's a little bit of a new area. Um, yeah. But this study looked at eumenorrheic women. So normally menstruating female athletes and then those with menstrual disorders, menstrual disturbances that would likely be caused by the low energy availability. And they found that the group of athletes with the menstrual disorders also had slower reaction times, less muscular endurance and less strength. So likely that's going to impact, you know, team sports or yeah, all of these different sports, the low energy availability likely impacts that. I don't know if we have data like where we take, let's say, like a team of soccer players and then we restrict their caloric intake and see what happens. I don't know if we have that yet, although they, they're they doing some of those studies now. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, it certainly impacts like reaction time. It's probably going to impact patterning, like, you know, how you do a particular movement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I can think I can see that from it experience mm -hmm. too right like if mm -hmm. you're not eating enough like one of the first things for me to go is like I start to feel spacey in my yeah. head right like mm -hmm. I am not going to react as quickly yeah right? exactly um yeah. it's mm -hmm. very interesting cool okay let's talk about the course just a little bit um you've been working on you've been working on it with us you did you wrote I think the most part of three modules uh for us like just tell us a little bit about like what those modules contain and why someone might you know be interested in take in in that aspect of this of the course sure so my first module was kind of metabolism for beginners and metabolism is kind of dry and it's like it's one of the topics in exercise physiology that I think undergrads sometimes get you know bored with but I think it's important to understand how you how your body creates energy and then how and like what fuels go into that and I think it's important just from a very basic level because then you can understand nutrition directly you know you're like okay carbohydrate goes towards this fat goes towards this this is how my body creates energy through all these different types of exercise um yeah, I think it's just important as coaches or athletes or just recreational people, you know, just to have that understanding, um, especially like, yeah, when we think of how we decided to be fat burning machines and not <laughs> eat carbohydrate. Now we know that carbohydrate is, you know, it powers all types of exercise and that you're simply limiting your ability to perform if you're not taking it in. So I think just having that basic understanding is important. And then I have um, modules on REDS. So like we talked about relative energy deficiency in sport and some, yeah, female athlete development. Ooh, yeah, we should talk about that. Um, <laughs> but I think where, where it becomes important for people is like, so I did a lecture on REDS the other day in a first year nutrition course for kinesiology. And there's only like three students out of, I don't know, about a hundred who had heard of it. And I was very surprised by that because I was expecting like by now it's been out for many years. I feel like a lot of varsity runners and stuff know about it. So I expected way more students to know about it yeah. and they hadn't even heard of it. And it, that blew my mind. And so I really think just getting that out there continuously, like we continue to talk about it, continue to kind of spread what we know I think it's super important because it'll, you know, help so many athletes and just people in general to know what's going on with their bodies if they just have that understanding. So, 
Yeah, totally. And you're, you kind of lit up there when you talked about female athlete development and that comes up in, in the course too. Like what is the, it might not be immediately obvious to everyone, like the connection between like nutrition, like I should, should I eat a salad now or should I eat a sandwich and like female athlete development? So what, are, how do the dots connect there? So this is, okay, there's a couple of things. <laughs> so in Young female athletes, um, I think this is important. And so, yeah, Lauren Fleshman, of course, writes about it in her book, um, mm-hmm. which I know you've talked about on your podcast. But um, up until like now, like very, very recently. Until now. I love that. <laughs> yeah, until we, now, we believe that. <laughs> we seem to just think that women and men or, or female male athletes would follow the exact same trajectory through puberty into, into their like performance. Yeah. You're um, right that that is up until now. Yeah. Like <laughs> I feel like you're right. We're at the moment where we like realize that the, well, we broadly realize like culturally that female the athlete development is different. Sorry. Continue. It's so weird. No, it's just so weird because like, so I was doing this lecture the other day on reds to these undergrads and I was like, Okay, let's go through puberty. Like, okay, we all learn this in grade four, right? We know that there's sex differences through puberty. We know that, and if we're talking about sports, so male puberty is going to look like a huge increase in testosterone. That's going to increase muscle mass. That's going to increase cardiac volume, lung volume, blood volume, you know, strength, power, all of these very ergogenic, so, you know, performance enhancing adaptations changes that's that's male puberty and it's driven by testosterone and then the testosterone receptors so they're able to use those that testosterone to create all these changes and then we have female puberty which doesn't have this huge influx in testosterone we have you know increases in estrogen progesterone and our bodies get ready to make babies and we gain a lot of adipose tissue which is fine and normal and healthy and that's what's supposed to happen but because of that you know we have boys go through puberty just get exponentially better at sports Mm -hmm. girls go through puberty um and they're gonna for a very small period of time not that small but a couple years they're Mm -hmm. gonna have probably a decrease in performance a dip in performance and that's because you don't have these adaptations that are performance enhancing you have adaptations that are enhancing towards making babies (laughs) right you know which is well said yeah yeah, Yeah. increase in adipose tissue that is not Mm going to help you you know in most sports but it is healthy and normal and unfortunately it does for a period of time cause a decrease in performance but you can certainly adapt and keep you know through training you're gonna get used to your new body and then you're gonna be fitter and stronger than ever but there is that period of a decrease in performance. And for whatever reason, even though we've known that forever, like this isn't new information, we just ignored it and thought, yeah, as girls get older, they're going to get faster, same as boys. Um, and I don't know why we didn't think about it. And then so, of course, you have these young female athletes who are gaining adipose tissue as they're supposed to do. No one told them that's normal, but they even though they should have known that they, they didn't know it was normal. So now you're trying to lose that adipose tissue because you're just trying to be as fit as you can for your sport um, or for aesthetic reasons for, you know, aesthetic sports or whatever it is. And so then you're trying to lose weight in a period of time where your body's trying very hard to gain weight. And then you cause, you know, all of the symptoms of reds. And on top of that, those are your peak bone formation years. So you know, bone mass is accrued until the ages of about 19 for women and 20 to 21 for men. And so if you're in a, if at that point in time, you're trying your hardest to lose weight and you're training for your sport and you're in reds, you're wanting that only time in your life where you build that bone mass. And then from that point on, you lose that bone mass through the rest of your life. And so this is how we have, you know, 25 year olds with osteoporosis who can break their hips by falling down and it's because they were trying to lose weight when they were their bodies were trying so hard to gain weight right wow which when you think about it could affect like the general population too because of like the pressures of diet culture and body image and all of those things and then with athletes you just have that next layer of like also trying to perform or trying to fit into whatever stereotype of the bodies of their sport like it's very 
crazy and complicated. And like you say, it's weird that we didn't think of this before. That's the, that's the thing that drives me crazy. It's like, like I'm explaining this to my undergrad class. I'm like, okay, hey, we learned about puberty and like sex differences through puberty, like what in grade four. And then like, you know, that throughout your whole life. And yet it's like, no one took a second and was like, Hmm, wonder what that means for sport or for training or for, yeah. 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 That's yeah, sad. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is it is and then you have like other pe- like other parts of like a woman's like we talk about too in the course like this like our regular cycling when we're in the regular cycling phase of our life and then perimenopause like and we don't need to unpack all that now because we do it in the course but like there are ways that relate there are things that relate to nutrition in all of those phases that we need to take into account how much we're eating with what different types of substrates right so that we can make sure that we're like healthy and well first before we start to train or as we're training yeah exactly it all comes down to you know you're going to if we care about performance, I know not everyone cares about performance, but if we care about doing the best in our, in a sport, then the only way to do so is to be healthy first. And so, yeah. How do we best support health? And then, then we can worry about, you know, yeah. Or performance or yeah. So interesting. Yeah. And that's how, like when, even when we're talking about the core, so like, okay, we want the course to be appealing to like both people who are interested in performance, like you're saying, um, but also to like just normal active women right and in some ways like a lot of it's all the same thing right because you have to be first you have to be well (laughs) and healthy and then you know and then you can add on what you need and support those needs to nutrition for whatever your activity level is right like whether it's a one hour like I'm like a now I'm like normal active woman like I'm not you know like I have zero performance goals yeah Um, other than my vo2 max test every week (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) But yeah. I I would hate to do that. I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And what do you do to keep active now? In general, I I just kind of bike and run for fun. I like mountain biking now. Um I try to do weights a couple of times a week, mm. but I also really enjoy being outside. So, yeah, it's it's like what I can do outside. So, running and biking is my favorite. Um But then I am always enrolled in these weird studies that require high levels of fitness. And so right now I'm in a six week training block and I'm trying to ride on Zwift almost every day and do a VO2 max test every week. And I know that I'm not even close to my fitness as when I was an athlete, but that's fine. Um, Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm like one foot in either world, like one foot of just fully recreational do what I want kind of thing with some strength mixed in because I do really enjoy that um and then the other foot in like oh I gotta actually train sometimes <laughs> right this okay I, what's interesting to me is that like you're you're both the academics so you're like research you're researchers so you're like researching mm-hmm. right but then it's kind of like is there such a gap is there such a big gap to get people involved in these studies that you feel like you have to like you're like okay I'll do another one <laughs> It, there is a big gap. So when we talk about, um, you know, we want to have more women research on women and, and women athletes. And we talk about how that's like this huge gap in, in the literature, which it is. Um, it's also a very big recruiting challenge. And I think you've talked about it in one of your podcasts with just how we have less women doing triathlon races. We have less women in competitive sport because maybe they have societal pressures. They feel like that's a selfish endeavor or you know there's different cultural societal reasons but um so yeah if I'm doing a running a training study like a high like a hard training study I might get 10 to 15 men and three women and the three women is like me finding my friends that I know right right? (laughs) and including myself so um and then, and with that, so then that's the thing is that say you have 15 men and three women, you can't look at sex differences there, um, which is kind of what we need. Like we need to know what, how is this, you know, female physiology differ? It doesn't even matter if it's different. It's like, what is the unique female physiology? But we're not, we don't have the numbers to actually look at that when we're doing these studies. So um, yeah, that's one reason. And I think too, just like, because of my background, um, in you know high performance triathlon 
I, I can do the studies. A lot of people can't do them. So like, okay, I will do oh, them. <laughs> right. You're like, okay, if you have two tests, like at least you yeah. know what that is and you know, exactly. you know, what that, that you, <laughs> yeah. you're going to have a thing on your face and it's going to be awful and you're going to be slobbering and <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you do it again. And actually every VO2 max <laughs> test I do, it's always the last two minutes where you're like, I don't think I can do this anymore, but you know, you're not done. And mm -hmm. so then you have, I always just tell myself, you can do anything for two minutes. <laughs> and it just gets harder and harder throughout that two minutes. And then all of a sudden your legs stop and then you're like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. Well, good for you <laughs> for helping out in so many ways on so many levels. It's, it's fun and not fun at the same time. Um, and Alex, do you do social media at all? Can people follow you somewhere? Yeah, I... So I'm on Twitter and that used to be my big, my big platform. Um, so I'm super Alex underscore C um, on Twitter. I feel like Twitter is falling apart right now. It's not as fun. So I don't know if it's going to still exist in a while, but that was my, that was my best one to follow me. Yeah. Hmm. Awesome. Um, and the course is called Fueled and I'm going to put all the links, make sure all the links are in the show notes. It goes on sale. The first round goes on sale April 12th, between April 12th and 21st. And we're running two cohorts for that first group. So one is going to be um, a general founding cohort for anyone who wants to sign up, whether you're an active woman or someone who coaches active women. Uh, and then also we have a menopause cohort that's happening um, in the first round. And then we are also, if you're listening to this and it's way past April 21st, but mm -hmm. you want access to the course, just go to fueledcourse.com and get go on the wait list. I think we're going to do summer school. We'll probably do something in the fall as well with the course um, and probably different cohorts, like for different sports or one for coaches and stuff like that. So it's pretty fun. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you, Alex. It's been so fun. Um, and I look forward to more. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. Prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose. For decades, running shoes have been researched, tested, and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedda's. Hedda's designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. 
Hedda's unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male-biased industry. Hedda's have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. Hedda's has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedda's at Hedda's.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedda's.com and it will all be in the show notes. <laughs>